Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Price Check Sports Podcast here on the In The Zone Network where we go city to city, state to state, worldwide. I'm your host, Josh Price, checking back in today with a special episode. Our mailbag episode is here. Uh, we you know, try to do this thing once a year or so. Um, last time we did it was a couple years back now. Uh, back towards the tail end of 2021, beginning of 2022, uh, coming out of the pandemic. And, of course, now trying to keep this going as a little bit of a tradition here uh, on the show. So last time we did it was mostly basketball-centric questions. Uh, this will be a little bit of a mix, NBA, NFL, and a couple you know miscellaneous topics uh, that the folks wanted to hear from us. So um, biggest thing, first, let me start off by saying thank you to those who did uh, submit questions to us, whether it was by email or to our uh, DM uh, on our price check Instagram account. Um, so I guess time to just go ahead and kind of jump into it, man. So uh, first question coming from the world of the NFL. We'll start with football, tri- trickle our way down to the basketball questions, and then save our miscellaneous questions for the very end. But first, NFL-wise, first question that we got, will the Dallas Cowboys pay Dak Prescott $60 million a year? Now, precedent for this question, of course, some news came out here uh, throughout the week that uh, Dak is, of course, trying to reset the quarterback market. He's looking for a big deal. $60 million a year is the range that he's kind of targeting. Um, and to be honest, I think the better question is should they rather than will they? The Dallas Cowboys are going to pay Dak Prescott. I, I, I don't think I'm breaking any news. I don't think that's a controversial statement um, because the real question is if they don't pay Dak Prescott, then who do they go get? There's, I mean, if you look at even just like this year's free agent class, got Kirk Cousins coming off of an, uh, off of an Achilles tear or an Achilles injury. You got Justin Fields who is needing to be traded, um, and then your options just kind of start to dwindle away from there. Russell Wilson, like, so you think about that this year is probably not going to be very many great options for you next year because again, the teams that have good quarterbacks that they don't want to let get away, they're either going to extend them or franchise tag. So if you're Dallas, you're probably going to pay that. Um, do I think they should? To be honest, Dak isn't a terrible quarterback. It's just he's not the best quarterback in the league or like top three or top five. But I do think that Dak is a worthy enough quarterback to start resetting that quarterback market. Uh, because as we're going to see, once he gets $60 million, then the next five, six, seven, eight quarterbacks that are up for huge deals are also going to get that same $60 million. And so it, that is going to be a very uh, minor consequence when it comes to uh, what the actual on-field results are. And so I do think they are probably going to pay Dak that money. Um, whether you think they should or not is obviously up for debate, but I just don't think there are going to be other options for them that are better than that than Dak that are also going to be cheaper than Dak, whether it's cheaper in the actual contract that they pay um, or whatever assets it takes to go out and acquire that other quarterback. So, yes, Cowboys will be paying Dak million. Dak Prescott $60 million a year, if not more, uh, on his next contract. So, thank you for that. Um, next one, which team should Justin uh, Fields be traded to? Or, I'm sorry, which team should trade for Justin Fields? And so, we talked about him needing to be traded. Chicago still saying that they're a little bit on the fence as to whether or not they're going to trade him. Um, or just outright draft Caleb Williams or somebody else um, and, of course, kind of figure it out later. Um, The one answer to me that's a no-brainer is the Atlanta Falcons. Just do it. You have Desmond Ritter and you have Taylor Heineke as your only quarterback options. You're at pick number eight in the draft. You're not going to get one of the elite quarterbacks in the draft. And and to be a thousand percent honest outside of Caleb Williams. We don't even know that these guys are going to be elite. We're, you know, obviously hoping so. And hell, we don't really even know what Caleb, we see a lot of can't miss prospects coming to the NFL all the time, but ask the Jacksonville Jaguars, how can't miss Trevor Lawrence looks right now. Just saying, you know, you, you have guys who come in year in and year out that don't quite meet the expectation. And so, you know, you could either take a swing on like a JJ McCarthy in the draft, which, I mean, he was a glorified game manager to me at Michigan. I could be wrong about that, but glorified game manager to me at Michigan. Um, you can try to trade up to get one of those top three picks, but then you're giving up more draft capital for that than you would just trading the second round pick or, or you know, and some other spare parts for Justin Fields. Now, granted, you will have to pay Justin Fields after this, but 
again, it's a show and prove type of thing. If he shows you in this first year of you acquiring him, um, you know, that he's the quarterback of the future for you, I think you got to take that chance. Justin Fields doesn't have, you know, granted he hasn't had a, a great start to his career, but he also doesn't have these just terrible, terrible traits like we saw with like a Mitchell Trubisky or something like that, where you can't see yourself moving forward with him. He's shown enough flashes. He's shown, you know, a, a lack of consistency. But at the same time, the man got drafted and got thrown out there with his best, like, passing targets as Darnell Mooney and Cole Komet. Like, who, who's going to succeed in that environment? So I do think the Falcons should be the team to trade for Justin Fields. They got the weapons around him. You got B. John Robinson. You got Kyle Pitts. You got Drake London. Um, the defense stepped up for them last year. So I think they got they got the best kind of, like, ready-made roster for him to step into and then have the expectations to be able to uh, succeed. Because, again, you're also in the NFC South where Tampa was okay. They, I mean, they weren't great. Um, the Carolina Panthers are dumpster fire. And you have uh, who are the New Orleans Saints, also slight dumpster fire right now. So if you're the Falcons, you can get Justin Fields today and be ready to win a division tomorrow. Simple as that. So, Falcons, please go make that happen for Justin Fields. Uh, and then uh, of our uh, NFL questions, the final one here, do you think St. Louis should get another NFL team? Um, again, the, the wording here is what's uh, most operative. Should St. Louis get another NFL team? I do think the NFL should consider the, uh, bringing the team to St. Louis again. Problem is math, right? There are already 32 teams in the league unless somebody is moving out of their current city to St. Louis. I don't see the NFL expanding beyond 32 teams. Um, don't really see the need for that. What, you know, obviously more money would be great for them. But you start thinking about, like, what that means for, like, conference balance and things like that. You have to find in a second city that you'd also want to put an NFL team in along with St. Louis. So I do think the NFL should be – uh, should have his eyes or should bring a team back to St. Louis, but I just don't really see in, in what situation it makes the most sense. Um, you know, especially, you know, given how the situation played out with the Rams at the end, I also don't know that the city is going to be 100% receptive to the NFL coming back. They showed some great um, fan support for the Battle Hawks of what was the XFL, now UFL. I expect that to continue moving forward. Um, and I think, you know, that'll definitely continue to put some eyes on St. Louis as a football market. But I, I truly don't see the NFL being back in St. Louis unless something drastic happens league wide from an expansion standpoint. So now moving on to NBA questions. First question on the NBA. Uh, what would be the best way to fix all star weekend? So um, this one is a little interesting because, of course, all star weekend to me used to be like appointment viewing. It used to be you stop what you're doing to tune into things like the dunk contest, the actual all-star game itself, right? Now these are just events like that are kind of like, okay, we have to do them from a fan standpoint, but we don't see that there's really any real player interest in making sure that these games or these events are of the utmost quality. So to me, you definitely have to do some type of like king of the court one-on-one -on -one type of situation uh, for All-Star Weekend. So whether that replaces the dunk contest or is another event outside of that, because uh, my my thing with the dunk contest is that I just don't know how many new creative dunks we're going to see and be wild by. I think the dunk contest was great in, you know, the 80s and 90s because you were starting to see the creativity for the first time. Whereas now, I mean, you look at like <laughs> Jalen Brown, like I hate to, to keep, you know, uh, throwing dirt on him while, or kicking him while he's down. But at the same time, his dunk contest performance was not great. You could tell that he was just out there trying stuff that meant things to him but did not really, you know, resonate with the fans. Um, so I just – I don't know how much more interesting you can make the dunk contest seeing all the dunks that we've seen throughout history. Um, now, one-on-one, -on -one, though, if you put, let's say, $10 million – on a King of the Court tournament for the best 16 guys or the 16 guys that are all-stars that people want to see play one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe you don't throw all of the big men into that uh, equation, but maybe they want to get included. So you take 16 guys, you then put them in a, a bracket 
let him go one on one. The man left standing in that one on one tournament wins the pot. Now you also, in terms of the actual All Star game itself, you can rather than doing you know East versus West and then doing you know five on five, which are subs like a standard game. You could do kind of similar to what the hockey uh, All Star game is in uh, in the NHL, where you take some guys and go you know like some different sets of threes, go three on three in a tournament style thing to see who ultimately wins. I think that might put a little bit of a uh, more competitive spirit, competitive balance into it uh, versus guys just going out there jacking up shots. Cause you had like Luca shooting a shot from, you know, one uh, free throw line to the other end of the court had no chance. You got guys that aren't running back on defense. Um, and I, to a, an extent, I do also get the NBA standpoint or some of the player standpoint of like, Hey, this is also supposed to be a break for us. So, we do understand that, you know, this is a game we want to get up and down, but at the same time, we're trying to protect ourselves so we can go back to our teams after this, um, which another story for another time. But I do think the player movement era has also kind of killed All-Star Weekend in the sense that it's not a wow factor for us to see guys like Devin Booker and Kevin Durant on the same team because they're already on the same NBA team. Um, and you can say guys have been teaming up for years, but – Back in the early 2000s and things like that, where some of these games were extremely competitive, um, you know, yeah, you had Kobe and Shaq on the same team, but you didn't have multiple all-stars or multiple sets of all-stars coming from the same teams throughout the league. So um, player movement combined with more talent being in the league, I just think, you know, you got to give somewhere. Uh, But tweaks definitely got to be made somewhere with the all-star game, and I think that would be where I would start. King of the court for sure as an all-star weekend event. Uh, and maybe doing some type of three-on-three tournament for the actual All-Star game as opposed to East versus West. So, good there on All-Star weekend. Next question for the NBA. Should Chet Holmgren win Rookie of the Year over Victor Wimbanyama? Uh, The answer is very simple for me. That is no. Uh, I get Chet has been great for Oklahoma City. Uh, Oklahoma City as a team is a much better team than the San Antonio Spurs right now. Um, totally opposite ends of the, the, the conference standards in the Western Conference. But I think if you just think about it simply as this, you put Chet on San Antonio right now instead of Wimby, they're just as bad, if not slightly worse. You put Wimby in all that he does on Oklahoma City right now, they are at worst just as good as they are right now. I think that's what it comes down to. Wimby, like 10 blocks in a game, he's, you know, He's taking guys off the dribble. He's hitting Giannis with backdoor cuts and going and slamming it home. Like what Wimby is doing, I think a lot of people are understating because the the Spurs just have outright been terrible from a win loss standpoint. Um, but I think it's it should very clearly be rookie of the year going to Wimby as opposed to Chet. Chet has looked great, but Chet has also had some games where you know he's been able to have off nights and the team still win. Uh, I don't think you can say that Oklahoma City's success is on the back of Chet Holmgren, even if you want to say that Wimby's numbers mean nothing because he's doing it on the losing team. It's not like Chet is Shea where he's going out here averaging 30 a night and carrying the team with his score and some of the other things he does. He's being added to a team that was already pretty good. So give me Wimby for rookie of the year, even if that's a slightly unpopular opinion. Also, we remember – that we kept the receipts. Y'all were out here talking trash about how, you know, Ben Simmons shouldn't be eligible for rookie of the year in his second year when Donovan Mitchell was looking like a rookie of the year candidate. And y'all still gave it to Ben Simmons. Now, shoes on the other foot. We actually like Chet. So it's like, okay, well, you know, maybe Chet should win rookie of the year since he didn't get to play last year. Not having it. Give it to Wimby, man. So um, next on the uh, list of questions here, last one for the NBA. Will the Bucks regret hiring Doc Rivers? Um, I think the answer is no, surprisingly. I don't think they'll regret hiring Doc Rivers. To be honest, they should regret right now firing Adrian Griffin. Um, And I know those things might sound like the same, but they're they're definitely not mutually exclusive here. Uh, Whoever they hired in Milwaukee, I think, would be struggling right now given – where they took that team over and kind of what things needed to change with the team. 
Um, but I think firing Adrian Griffin before giving him a chance to kind of overcome and learn from some of those coaching mistakes that he was making, even with the team being like 17 or 16 games above 500 at the time that he was hired. Um, I think that is one decision that they'll regret. And to be honest, I think they might end up regretting the Damian Lillard trade. Dame has looked great in spurts. Of course, he just won All-Star Game MVP, won the three-point contest. Great for Dame individually. Uh, but there are some nights as a tandem with him and Giannis and just him on that team where he don't got it the same way he had it in Portland. He's not pulling up and hitting, you know, five of eight from three-point range. Sometimes that's more like two of eight. Um, and I can attest to somebody who's uh, placed wages on his player props on points and three-pointers. Uh, it's not the same as it was in Portland for him right now. So I do think that um, there's a lot of other factors right now for Milwaukee that you can point to outside of just Doc Rivers. Um, do we know that Doc is going to maybe you know blow a game or two here in the playoffs? Probably. But I also look at that team and say, you know, Damian Lillard isn't as consistent as, he, as he's been throughout his entire career in Portland. Um, guys like Bobby Porter's Pat Connaughton aren't playing the same type of role. Um, that they played in previous seasons. You've had guys like Chris Middleton and Brooke Lopez in and out of the lineup with different injuries. Um, and Milwaukee's just not that deep of a team. Like, they went and made the trade for Pat Bev over, you know, campaign, which great for them to do that, but they need Pat Bev right now. Like, and, and not saying that there's anything wrong with that Pat Bev, obviously, still a great defensive player, can still do some things for you uh, in, you know, as a secondary playmaker offensively, get all that. Uh, but when you look up midseason and that's the one big move you can make, I think that says a lot about the rest of your team. So, um, you know, will they regret hiring Doc Rivers? Maybe. I don't think so. But you can say maybe. Um, I, I just I think there are some other things, uh, some other moves along the way that they could also regret just as more or if not more um, than what, you know, the hiring of Doc was. So my two cents on the Bucks and Doc, I do think the Bucks will still make a pretty – deep run in the playoffs when it's all said and done. So, last couple questions for us here. First one, most money you've missed out on from a parlay. So, funny story on this one. Uh, this is the 2021 playoffs. So, this is the same uh, playoffs that resulted in the Bucks and Suns uh, NBA Finals. Um, it is the Clippers and Jazz, I believe, second-round series Pretty sure this is a clinching game where Terrence Mann ends up going off, you know, something crazy for like 40 points um, and helping the Clippers get their first conference finals berth. Um, there was a parlay, crazy amount of legs. It was already off to a horrible start. But we get to the fourth quarter. We need a total of 10 rebounds from Rudy Gobert. I think he had like eight at the time. Um, and I needed Paul George to get to 30 points and three made threes. Um, at the time... Rudy Gobert, I think with like five minutes left, gets his 10th rebound. So we got that checked off. We need two more points, one more three-pointer from Paul George. Uh, five minutes to go in the rest of the game. He does not make a shot in the remaining five minutes because Terrence Mann makes every shot that the team needs the remainder of the game. Um, and that was for a whopping $10,000. Hard stop. So, yes, this is our Now, I grant it. You know, I didn't wager $10,000. Don't hear me wrong. Did not wager $10,000. But result would have been $10,000 in terms of winning. So, thank you, Paul George. You are uh, still on the ban list thanks to that. But we appreciate all your contributions to the game of basketball. Thank you, Paul George. Uh, and then last question for us. Athlete you would want to interview most for the price check. So, this one is a little bit different depending on the sport, right? So, I think from a basketball standpoint, the one former pro athlete I would probably want to interview most, probably Shaq. I know we see a lot of Shaq on TNT. We see him do interviews for a lot of people, but I think a Shaq interview would be fun just because he's going to have stories for days. He's a fun person to talk to in general. Um, and Shaq is not the guy that is going to hold any punches for you. He's going to tell you how it is. Um, second to that would probably be Gilbert Arenas because I think Gilbert Arenas is just a guy that's going to come in and shoot the shit like anybody. Um, so those would be the two from a basketball standpoint. 